This mock interview candidate was asked, what is the most interesting thing that you've independently taken on learning in the last 12 months? Before jumping into what the candidate had to say, I wanna talk a little bit about the question that was asked, why, and a little bit about the leadership principle at play. As a practical matter, this is a leadership principle that is rarely targeted in interviews. Why? Well, there's other ways to get at it, right? You can kind of tell how intellectually curious a candidate is by the way they answer the questions, the way they talk about the work that they do, uh, et cetera. And there are uh, a couple of other ways to get at something like this with a similar question, uh, saying customer obsession, which is uh, what's the most interesting thing you've learned about your customers in the last 12 months? Or what's the most interesting thing you've learned about your target company, right? If you're interviewing for a company, what's the most interesting thing you've learned about them in, in, as you prepare for your interview? Uh, and so there's different ways to get at what is really being sought in this question about you as a candidate. And of course, at Interview Ad, our mission is to help 100 thousand job seekers land their dream job. And we do this by diving deep into the interviews as they happen, giving you feedback as to what was going on and critically analyzing how the candidate could have done better so that you show up better, more authentically in your interviews. First and foremost, as an interviewer, what I'm after is do you have intellectual curiosity? Do you like to learn new things? And how do you do that, right? Uh, do you take time to read papers, websites, whatever, uh, listen to podcasts, watch videos, uh, mentor people, right? Teaching them how to do things, right? One, one of the greatest ways you can learn how to do something is actually try to teach it to somebody, uh, which that's probably a good idea for me is probably teach people how to code because woof, this has been a rough month. But at the end of the day, what I'm looking for is are you demonstrating the patterns of being a lifelong learner? An additional thing that I'm looking for is, well, are, are you looking to learn things end to end? Or are you demonstrating that you're just kind of a surface level learner, right? Because that, that can be of varying levels of importance depending on the role. But understanding the type of learner that you are translates into how you solve problems at work. Now, an obvious question that's going to come up of this is, well, it, do I need to talk about something in the interview about something that I took on learning for work? And th there's a couple of different ways to think about this, right? Uh, if you have a deeply technical job and or you're new in your career, then it might make sense to pull something that you took on independently for, for your work uh, that you wanted to learn. Uh, but I've had customers walk me through some uh, just a wide range of topics uh, from uh, teaching themselves music production. Uh, I had someone walk me through how they learn how to restore classic car engines uh, from watching YouTube videos. So there's, there's a range of topics that you can cover, but it's not the what that matters. I care most about your level of excitement right? How passionate are you about it? Because that overriding passion, your why and the how, those are the things I care about because it's going to help me understand, will you push through the difficult things? Will you learn what you need to learn? Or are you just going to kind of be like, ah, you need to learn this thing. Yeah, yeah. Let me read a few things, blah, 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 blah. So with that as set up, the candidate this week is a UX researcher and they were targeting a role at big tech, which is called big tech, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, that sort of thing. Um, and the things I want you to look out for, here's three things I want you to look out for as you watch this video, just given what I've just said, uh, here's what I want you to look out for. Does the candidate do a good job of sharing with me the how and the why of what they went about learning independently? Okay, that's number one. Number two, did the candidate actually make the case that they have genuine curiosity? Now, you would think as a, as a UX researcher, that's literally in the, the title of their role, that they are naturally intellectually curious. Do they make that case in the context of the interview? The reason why I, I kind of harp on this point just a little bit here is, remember, you and I, if I'm if I'm the interviewer and you're the candidate, we only have an hour together, right? I don't, I don't know anything about you. I might have read your resume. I might have looked at your LinkedIn, but I don't really know anything about you. So the entirety of the corpus of what I'm gauging my assessment of you is based on what you share with me in the time that we have together. So does this candidate make the case that they have intellectual curiosity? And finally, uh, is there anything novel or new in terms of what they targeted learning in their answer? As is always the case, I will jump in from time to time with feedback on things I was thinking as I was watching the interview's answer playback, things I'm targeting when I ask the follow-up questions, that sort of thing. Can I help you really understand from an interviewer's point of view what's going on in the interview? Focus now on just kind of you and, and what you, things you find interesting. Uh, so mm -hmm. in the last 12 months, right, uh, COVID has made life interesting for, well, everybody. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious, I'm always curious, but this is a, you know, almost a, a great time to ask this question. What, what is the most interesting thing that you've taken on independently learning in the last 12 months? 
Um, so I I would say again uh, like UX research is something that <laughs> I've uh, decided to to learn more about. So I have a, a research doctorate, but again uh, UX research is a little bit different. So uh, with that said, I've been taking um, courses. There's this um, this website called the Interaction Design Studio, I, I believe it's called, or Internet Interaction Design Foundation, um, and I've been taking their UX courses. I also um, took a course um, through this platform called Maven, where I connected with people that were previously working in UX research or currently working in UX research, and learning how they um, are able to engage in storytelling and. Um, other soft skill techniques in order to um, have their findings resonate with the cross-functional team, so that way the research findings are implemented. And so I found that to be really valuable. That just ended uh, about a month ago. Um, and so yeah, so I think uh, yeah, engaging in those different learning opportunities has led me to really discover that the work that I'm doing in research is actually a whole field. So rather than me kind of doing this independently on my own, one of the reasons why I'm wanting to make this transition is to be able to join a larger team with a larger set of resources to be able to do this to its maximum potential. This is certainly a case where the candidate definitely stepped in it a little bit, right? Which is, I have a PhD, I'm a researcher, and UX research is different. So that's what I wanted to learn. And I took some courses. It's actually a fine answer. It's a, it's, it's a fine starting point, young in their, relatively their career, if they've just completed their PhD. Um, but it, it's, it's so adjacent, like so adjacent to what they're doing for work that it's not entirely clear that it was independently driven, right? It's you taking on extra work at work to do work better is not really the same as I have independent thought. I have, I have an independent set of desires that might help me at work. True story. But it's not necessarily going to uh, be looked at as, well, you need to know this in order to do your work. Therefore, you need to go take this as additional learning that you don't yet have. And so this is a case where, you know, I would say normally it's fine to pick work things, but this is just so adjacent to their job, it's a little bit of a struggle to get excited about it. And quite frankly, if you listen to them over my old sound setup with the keyboard going in the background, I apologize for that. But if you listen to the candidate talking about it, do you hear excitement? Because I certainly don't. And that's somewhat problematic. Um, so I can I can definitely see the connective tissue between, you know, a, a, a large majority of your adult life, PhD, thesis defense, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. And kind of UX research, I get that. But um, what, I, I guess what was the, the, the thing that kind of pushed you over the edge to spur you to take action? Yeah. So I would say the, the pandemic. So, uh, when the pandemic started, I was actually in Mexico city and I was preparing to do a postdoc at UC San Diego to, um, to do work on what my dissertation was about. My, my dissertation followed a group of Harvard undergrads as they went through all four years of college and, um, sought to make meaning of their experience. And so I was going to work with a person at UC San Diego who is an expert in that area. The pandemic struck, um, because UC San Diego is a public institution, they froze all of their hiring and my, my postdoc was delayed. But one of the benefits was that Harvard um, gave all graduating students a, a, a pandemic postdoc for lack of a better term. Okay. And so I could have stayed in academia. And then I realized um, like this would actually be a great time to transition into tech. And so that was actually one of the reasons why I made the transition from academia into tech, um, because I saw it as a way for me to be able to learn valuable skills. And now with the world kind of being turned upside down, I, I think that if I ever did want to go back into academia, there are going to be many more non-traditional routes into academia. So before it was the PhD postdoc assistant professor, and I think the world has been shaken up so much that I don't think that it would be completely outlandish to go from academia to tech, back to academia, et cetera. So um, that was actually one of the reasons why I decided to, um, th that's why I'm in the tech industry now is because of the pandemic. Sure. A surefire tell the candidate is unclear about their answer uh, and whether or not they've, they've done a good job of answering a question is the nervous laugh. 
right? I don't know if you caught the nervous laugh there at the end, but it's one of those where you've given an answer and you kind of get to the end and you think to yourself in your head, my goodness, what did I just say? Because the, the, the question that initially was asked was, what, what is the most, you know, something you've learned independently in the last 12 months? Cool. Uh, and the follow-up question was, what caused you to take action? And cool that COVID was happening and, and the pandemic occurred. Okay, fine. But it's not really clear, like, okay, so I wanted to make the jump to tech and leave academia, but why? Because I got my, I, I, like, the story doesn't really have a cohesive narrative around why did you take take on learning this thing? Why was it important to you? How did, you know, what was it that got you excited? How did you go about learning it? Uh, I'm just kind of enumerating the FAQ questions mentally that I'm cataloging in my head as I'm listening to this answer that the candidate has as of yet not answered. This is why ad-libbing in an interview can lead to challenges such as this, which is an answer doesn't present as your authentic self. You're kind of riffing and maybe you're talking through it. And unless you're a gifted, gifted storyteller, sometimes you will present as laconic, uh, uninspired, uh, kind of flat, because you're basically making up your answer as you go because your level of preparation for interview hasn't really considered all of the potential areas about which you might be asked. Now, this is, again, I said at the the front, this is a rare type question, right? Uh, To learn and be curious, specific leadership principle. But uh, being asked how you learn or or, or questions about how you learn, that's a broader topic that is likely to come up uh, in interviews around research, around more junior developer roles, around more junior product manager roles, right? Where a a rapid uh, curve progression is required to be successful. And for this one, the answer so far just isn't lining up in a way that's making me as the, the interviewer excited about what I'm hearing. Where I look at this person and go, yeah, no, this intellectual curiosity, great. He's getting after it and he really wants to go learn new stuff and I understand his process. It's, it's, not, it's just not coming together. And so from, from everything you've learned, and let's, let's focus on uh, either the courseware or the, the meaningful interactions with the community at Maven. Mm-hmm. Uh, of what you learned, what do you believe? Uh, I understand this is a belief just because you haven't worked in, in, in a tech company yet, so you're, you're making a best guess. Uh, will be the most directly applicable to this intended role? What will be the most direct? Like, what do my what, what of what you learned is going to be able to be oh. most directly translatable to this intended role? <clears throat> um, this is kind of a freebie question, right? I, I'm literally asking them, what, what did you learn, take on learning independently? They elected to go with a thing that is very much adjacent to the job that they're targeting. And this, this is almost a softball question of, okay, then how is this going to be applicable to what you're going to do? And again, you can tell that the, the candidate really hasn't thought through presenting this information because he's even struggling to make that connection, even though the connection should be pretty obvious because it, it is literally... Tell me about this thing that you took on learning, which is directly adjacent to the job that you're targeting and how you think it's going to be applicable to what it is you're going to go do. I would say, um, for example, in the the course that I did um, at Maven, I think uh, one of the things that would be most applicable is, again, having those soft skills. And so I think um, even now, like with the the controversy around Facebook and like one of the major controversies were that, were that they had research, but that they weren't implementing the research. And so they just had these research findings that they were sitting on and not doing anything with. And I think one of the reasons why that was happening is because there was a lack of storytelling or convince, uh, persuasive storytelling rather, and um, just those soft skills to make those connections with cross-functional teams who can make who can take the findings and implement them in ways that the research team isn't able to. And so I think having the opportunity to learn from people that work in UX research across a variety of fields, so whether that be um, high tech, so uh, Twitter or kind of a a company that's just now beginning to build out its research department, um, I think that it was interesting to see that wide gamut of experiences and the different ways that they engage in storytelling. And I think that that's definitely something I believe that I'll take with me into the, this new role um, to be able to, um, again, have persuasive storytelling methods to be able to convince people to implement the findings that emerge from research. Sure. Um, this is not a follow-up question, more of just a comment. I'll just, just kind of take this as an aside. I would, I would argue that the axiom of follow the money probably applies here, having worked 
most of all of my career in the tech field and just businesses in general, whether or not people mm-hmm. intentionally were acting in the economic self-interest of the company. I would say that the research wasn't ignored because they couldn't sell it. The research was report ignored because it went against the, the unstated or even clearly stated corporate goals, which is growth or whatever, right? And to the extent that people prioritize one over the other, that's probably what held it back. Not that they were unable to sell it, they probably lacked the foundational elements to sell it because it simply couldn't overcome the headwinds internally of, yeah, but that's mm-hmm. gonna stop growth and I can't have that, right? I'm gold on growth or I'm gold on revenue or I'm gold on whatever, uh, as opposed yeah. to I'm gold but on I think the right that, decision for people's health. Yeah, I agree. But I think that, uh, again, having those persuasive storytelling techniques would allow you to reconceptualize how you think about growth. So a lot of times we think about growth in tech companies as daily active users or things of that nature. But what about like substantive engagement? So maybe not having 10% increases in daily active users, but having a 10% increase in engagement on the platform because- Well, I think they did that. They just, they overpowered the angry emoji versus the hugs emoji. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because again, the underlying framework was growth. So right. it's it's one of those things where, you know, I don't try to ascribe malice where I can ascribe stupidity, but I think in this case, it's, I'm not going to ascribe malice where I can ascribe people probably were just behaving within the confines of a set of motivations and um, and a system that rewarded certain behaviors, whether intentionally mm-hmm. or not, because, you know, people understand systems and they understand incentives and they will figure out what incentives matter the most to get them whatever it is they want and then will behave accordingly. Right, right, right. right. That is, that is the problem with all systems. We try to design them to be perfect, they can't, and then someone, usually someone like myself, figures out how to skirt around the system because, hey, you didn't think about this corner case, and I did, and I'm gonna go do X, Y, and Z, right? So uh, yeah. that is the challenge. Well, that was an interesting, a side follow-up, I left it in here just so it, uh, well, once you can understand how the full, how these conversations, interviews can sometimes go off the rails and sometimes be relevant, but also there was an opportunity there for the candidate to kind of layer in some additional thought and. I don't know that he necessarily took the bait uh, to talk about the ability to sell research uh, inside of his company, right? The, the, the axiom of follow the money is definitely uh, applicable here, which is, yeah, you can present all the findings you want, but if it goes against the corporate goals, it's going to be challenging for you as a, as a researcher internally at a company to kind of overcome that corporate inertia. It's a bit naive to think that just because you show up and say, well, for the good of people, we should do X. Well, that's, that's generally not how uh, the systems work, depending on what gets rewarded. Um, the, the challenge, again, with this candidate, and, and overall, I enjoyed speaking with this candidate. I think there were, there were definitely areas for improvement. This was the weakest uh, showing for this candidate, if I look at, at, at my notes in the assessment. Um, there was a lot to like in terms of how his mind worked, but, but this question trapped him a little bit because he hadn't really given it a lot of thought. And this is why when I talk about how to prepare for interviews, uh, it's not... It's simply not enough to sit down and try to think up all the questions you might get asked, because this is a question you probably wouldn't think of. But when you think about the leadership principles that are applicable to your role, and as a researcher, learn and be curious is definitely one that's applicable to your role. That's a framework then for, oh, I should probably have some stories about how I learn or things I go and learn or or how I go and do things to enrich myself that is not necessarily 100% applicable to my job. And that's where I think preparation preparationally, I don't know if that's a word, got this candidate in trouble. And so it was a good conversation that we had uh, after the fact. And so pulling up the assessment that I would have read into the room for this candidate, uh, had I been on the loop, what I wrote was for learn and be curious, candidate presented a rather generic answer for this answer block. There was little in the way of genuine excitement uh, for the problem domain presented and additional drag was placed on the weight of the answer given its relative adjacency to the candidate's domain space. No real risk was presented, meaning risk to the candidate in terms of what they wanted to go and learn or difficulty in learning something. Uh, no uncomfortable learning opportunity was presented. The answer as delivered could have just as easily been an answer to the question, what was the last two years of your job like? And that's the problem. And, and this was actually uh, one of the pieces of feedback I gave to the candidate, which was to go back uh, and rewatch this specific answer block so that they could uh, consider the notes that I provided uh, and ask themselves whether or not they had presented a case to a potential employer uh, that they were a genuinely curious person. Were they exhibiting genuine curiosity? And how? Because as a researcher, your job is to ask questions, right? Have hypotheses, go chase down, do some research, figure out, and try to answer those questions. But if you're not a genuinely curious person, it's going to be hard to sell me. And again, we have a one hour time box, probably. And I've looked at your resume, probably, hopefully. I've looked at your LinkedIn, maybe, possibly. 
we have that one hour time box. And based on what you choose to present to me, I now have to assess whether or not I'm going to put my personal equity on the line and advocate for you as a candidate in the room with other people who I work with every day versus just saying, yeah, man, it was just okay. I may never see you again. Therefore, that doesn't hurt me. But if I advocate for you hardcore and the rest of the people in the room will kind of blah, that potentially hurts me. So you got to make it easy for me as the interviewer to advocate for your, uh, on, on behalf of you in the room with other folks because my default setting is no hire. It's just easier to say no hire. But we're, we're all tired of interviewing, right? We have roles we're trying to fill and this is a role that's important enough that we're interviewing for it. We want to fill a role. We don't want to just keep doing loops. So make it easier for us, convince us, but you do that by presenting the content in a way that is thought through and I use the FAQ model to think through all the questions that are likely to get asked by a senior leader who is listening to you tell the story. And, and a good framing is if you were telling the story to somebody trying to get a pay raise, which is essentially what you're doing when you're changing jobs, you're generally trying to get a pay raise or, or a, a position bump. Uh, if you were using the story, what would your boss ask you? Right? What, what pieces of information does your boss need to know? Because that's really where you need to focus. And there was a lot of kind of background and, and off the rails stuff in this answer. I don't know really made the case for this candidate.